And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Are there any believers here? Yes. I only saw a couple believers. How many believers are there here? Yes. Okay. Well, these signs ought to be following you if you're believers. That's what it says. I didn't say it. The Bible says it. And... Uh, Actually, in the King James, I think it's written in red. Amen? Amen. But today we're talking about the laws of healing, and the first law we're going to talk about is the law of contact and transmission. And uh, there are spiritual laws that have to do with healing. And so we're going to start by talking about the healing of the blind man, and not the man born blind. Uh, there were several people who, uh, blind men, who were healed by Jesus, but th this is just a blind man. And the story is in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. In verse 22, And he cometh to Bethesda, and they bring a blind man unto him, and he besought him to touch him. In verse 23, And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked if he saw aught or if he saw anything. Now, we're going to come back to this and talk about why he led him out of town. But I've read about Judaism in the time that this was going on, and they believed that spit had medicinal quality. Now, uh, so he spit upon his finger and touched his eyes with that because the, the Jews, believe, like I said, they believed it was medicinal uh, quality. Now, this is what the Jews believed, and Jesus must have believed it himself, and he laid hands on the man's eyes. In verse 24, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. So he saw, but he didn't see very well. He was partially healed. And I want you to get that, that he was partially healed. In verse 25 and 26, And after he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to anyone in the town. What I want you to get here is he put his hands on him a second time, and the man was totally healed this time. Now, some people say you shouldn't pray for something twice. Somebody didn't tell Jesus that. <laughs> Jesus prayed for him a second time, and he was totally healed. This time he could see Perfectly. Way back years and years ago, Kenneth Copeland uh, was talking about struggling against the devil. And what he said was, we don't play nine innings of baseball with the devil. He says, it's my bat, it's my ball, my glove. We play till I win. <laughs> well, did you hear what James said? Father God's the umpire. How long do we play? Till we win. And uh, does God want us to win? For sure God wants us to win. So the point is that if it doesn't work the first time, keep going, keep praying, keep laying hands on people. Now let's talk in, in Mark chapter 5 verse 25 to 34, we're going to talk about the woman with the issue of blood. Verse 28 and 29. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Now notice, Jesus didn't touch her. She touched him. But still, she was healed. 
and she was made whole of the blood flow that she had. Verse 30, and Jesus, immediately knowing him in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Now, it says that knowing that virtue had gone out of him. Now, virtue also means the anointing. It means the anointing of God or the power of God. And he said that he knew that it had gone out. And what I want you to realize here is that there is a real power that's transmitted from people who have the Spirit of God within them to others. Look at Acts chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. Now notice, it says special miracles by the hands of Paul, and it says cloths from Paul's body. And one of the things that we sometimes do is we'll take a handkerchief like this and we'll lay hands on it and we'll have everybody that's in ministry lay hands on it. And what the Bible teaches is that a piece of cloth is a battery for the anointing. Just like an electrical battery holds electrical power a piece of cloth can hold the power of God. And so you can take a handkerchief that's been prayed for, put it inside the pillowcase of your rebellious child or your unbelieving husband, and as they sleep, the anointing of God will change them. Or you can take piece of cloth that has the anointing and wear it under your clothes if you're sick yourself and let the healing power work in you. Back, back where we started, Mark 16, 17, and 18, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now notice what it says. It says, believers shall lay hands on the sick. If you're a believer, it says the signs follow you. They follow every believer. And if you don't have signs following you, probably it's because you're not laying hands on the sick. We're talking about believers shall lay hands on the sick. Let's talk about the anointing of believers. 1 John 2.20 but you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. The word unction means anointing. In 1 John, let's drop down to verse 27. But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it is taught you, you shall abide in him. But now that says that the anointing abides or resides in you. And you need to know that the anointing is tangible. You can feel the anointing of God. Sometimes during praise and worship, my lips will start to tingle or my hands will start to burn because that's the anointing that's there and it's tangible. Remember, Jesus felt well, he, he knew that the anointing had gone out of him. How did he know that the anointing had gone out of him? Because it was tangible. He could feel it. Now, who controls how much anointing you have in your life? You do. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. And be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. In the Greek, that's written in the present perfect tense. And you might say, well, what's that mean? I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that it should be read this way, and be being filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, it should be a continuing thing that goes on and on and on. 
So how does one keep being filled with the Holy Spirit? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Why do we have praise and worship before the service starts? To fill everybody with the Spirit of God. To bring the Spirit of God on the scene. See, a lot of people come late. They don't come in time for praise and worship. That's a big mistake. Because praise and worship prepares you to receive from God. It fills you with the anointing. It brings the power of God on the scene. It's one of the most important parts of the service. Amen? Let's talk about the law of the spoken word. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, what that says is that the Word of God is alive and powerful. Mark 2, verses 2 and 3. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door, and he preached the Word to them, and they came to him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now, notice what Jesus did. He preached the Word. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now, verse 5, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Jesus saw their faith. How did he see their faith? Because they acted on their faith. They acted on what they believed. Verses 6 and 10, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned with himself, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise and take up thy bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Jesus has the authority. You need to understand that. Jesus has all authority. Why does the world exist? Because Jesus said, let there be light, and there was light. Who said that? Jesus said that. Jesus said, let there be plant life, and there was light. Plant life. He said, let there be animal life, and there was animal life. Amen? Jesus is the one who spoke the world into being. Amen? He has the authority. Verse 11, And I say to thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. Now what Jesus did right here is he commanded healing to take place. Did he touch him? Did he do anything? No, he just spoke it. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. The man was instantly healed. I want to look at another instance of healing by speaking. We want to look at the nobleman's son. This is John chapter 4, verses 46 to 53. Verse 46, so Jesus came up again unto Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick of Capernaum and when he heard that was Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. Now remember we talked before about the man beseeching Jesus or begging him. So this is a nobleman and he came down and begged Jesus. Now this is kind of strange, because uh, in one gospel it says that he was a leader of the temple. He was a religious man, and the religious man didn't have a whole lot to do with Jesus. They didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus, and so he came down, the religious man came down, and he begged Jesus that he would heal his son. 
And then Jesus said to him, except you see signs and wonders, he will not believe. He's chastising him because the religious people didn't believe. And then the nobleman says to him, Sir, come down, lest my son die. And Jesus said to him, Go thy way, thy son lives. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken to him, and he went his way. So now Jesus spoke words of faith. He said, Your son's going to live. Uh, I said he spoke words of faith. You need to understand that words are containers. And you can fill those containers with anything that you want. You can fill them with doubt. You can fill them with fear. You can fill them with discouragement. You can fill them with cursing. Or you can fill them with faith, encouragement, and blessing. The book of Proverbs talks about that a lot, about the fruit of our lips. And the Bible says you're going to, it says in the book of Proverbs, you're going to eat from the fruit of your lips. In other words, your whole life, you're going to live as a result of what you say. I talked about this last week. You've all heard about a guy by the name of Zig Ziglar, I think. He was a motivational speaker. He died a few years back. He said this. He said, if you say you can... Or if you say you can't, you're right. So you have a choice on what you're going to put inside your words. Amen? But, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Now notice what it said. The man believed, and how did he believe? He acted to show that he believed. Verse 51, it was now going down, his servants met him and told him, your son lives. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend or get well. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the, flea, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, your son lives. And he himself believed and, he, and his whole house. When was the boy healed? When Jesus spoke. Amen? Now he was healed over a distance when he spoke. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. And Jesus came unto them and said, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. How much power is given to Jesus? All power in heaven and earth. He has all the authority. But then notice what he did. He took, turned right around, and he said, Go ye therefore. And when he did that, he delegated the power to us. How much power is delegated to us? All. Oh. Oh. Why isn't it manifested in our lives? Because we don't believe. John 14, verses 13 and 14. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. To ask here means to demand as a covenant right. Covenant right means, God, you wrote it in the book. You said that if I do this, you would do that. John 15, verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Same word, ask. But it, notice what it says. If you abide, stay full of Jesus and the word. Now how do you stay full of Jesus and the word? Well, you read the word every day. You sing praises to God every day. You pray in tongues every day. You stir up the anointing that's within you. Amen? You stay full of the word. John 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. When I was in Iran, I met a family by the name of Joe and Chris Guy. And they were new believers like we were when uh, we were in Iran. 
And uh, Chris Guy was a, a woman. I think she was an Italian woman. Italian women are important. Uh, she was suffering from something called Meniere's disease. Now, Meniere's disease is a disease of the inner ear. And what it does is if you stand up or try to walk, you're, you, you get all dizzy and you're like you're drunk and you fall over on your nose. And so she didn't walk very much. She spent most of her time in a wheelchair or she'd walk with a walker. And so the job that she has w was managing a laundromat. And one day she's sitting in a stool in the laundromat and a woman comes in the door and says, God sent me here to pray for you. And she said, you've got a short leg. And she prayed for her legs, and her leg grew out an inch, and instantly she was healed of Meniere's disease. Now, what does a short leg have to do with Meniere's disease? Who knows? But she prayed for him, and the woman was instantly healed. Well, Chris was immediately turned on to God. I wonder why. And her husband was turned on to God, and they, they became believers and uh, went about. But uh, nobody knows who the woman was who came in the door and prayed for her. She was just a person that came in and laid hands on the woman and prayed for her and spoke healing to her. Amen? And now let's talk about the law of faith. Hebrews 4.2 For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, being, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, what's faith? Faith is believing, but it's more than believing. It's acting upon what you believe. So, how many of you believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. How many of you believe that George Washington can do something for you now? No. George Washington's dead, right? How many of you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? He died and was resurrected from the dead. Okay. Okay. Now, how many of you believe that Jesus can do something for you now? Okay, so there's a difference between believing that George Washington was the first president and believing that Jesus is alive and well and could do something for you, right? So how do you demonstrate your belief in Jesus? Well, for one thing, Assume that this chair is Jesus. You place your life in his hands. Are you all with me? So if you believe that Jesus said that you can be healed by faith, then you do something that demonstrates your faith. If you believe that Jesus said healing comes through by speaking the word, then you speak the word. If you believe that they that lay hands, they shall lay, that they that believe shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover, then what do you do? You lay hands. Because if you believe, you'll do it. And if you don't do it, you don't believe. You're probably, see, you might be saying, well, what happens if I lay sick on people and nothing happens? Well, what that says is you don't believe. Because if you believed, you wouldn't ask, what if nothing happens? Does that make sense to you? So, I told you about Smith Wigglesworth who raised... 23 people from the, 3 to 23 people from the dead. He, he was an Englishman and he was a cockney. Do you, do you all know what a cockney is? It's a laboring class man that has an accent, sort of like uh, a British Brook, Brooklyn accent, you know? You skies, 
toity toid street and all of that, you know. Except what, the, what Cockney says, they say everything with an H. And he said, faith is a hat. Faith is a hat. Faith is a hat. What's that mean? Faith is a act. If you have faith, you will act. Amen? Mark 9, verses 23 and 24. Jesus said unto him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And straight away, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Now Jesus said, all things are possible for them that believe. Now, the Bible says, where do you have to believe? You have to believe in your heart. That's where your spirit man resides. You have to believe in your heart. It doesn't say anything about believing in your head. It says believing in your heart. And so what the man said, Lord, I believe in my heart. Help the unbelief in my head. Help me get my head lined up with my heart. Okay, how do you get your head lined up with your heart? You renew your mind by reading the word, hearing the word, until your head agrees with your heart. Until what God says overpowers what the world says. And so we got our our heart to believe the Word of God, and we got our heads to believe the Word of God. Mark chapter 5, verse 34. Now this is the woman that was healed of the issue of blood. And remember, she pushed through the crowd to touch him. He didn't touch her. She touched him. And when and he said unto her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of your plague. Now, earlier I said that she was healed because she touched him. That's where her faith was. She reached out and touched him. But Jesus said, the fact that you pushed through the crowd to get to me is what did it. You did something to demonstrate that you had faith. What did Jesus say? Your faith made you whole. Going back to the paralytic that was carried by four. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Notice what it says. Jesus saw their faith. Why did he see their faith? Because they did something. They acted. Now let's go to Jesus' hometown. This is Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Jesus in, is in Nazareth where he grew up. Verse 5, and he could do there no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about the villages teaching. Now he's in his hometown, and notice what happened. Doubt stopped Jesus from doing anything. And why was there doubt? Because the people looked at him and said, we know him. We know his his mother, we, know, we knew his father. His father's dead at this time. We, we, we know his brothers and sisters. His brothers and sisters are nothing special. Neither is he. He's just a hometown kid. So they didn't believe in him. Amen? And doubt kept him from doing anything. Now, I, I told you we'd come back to the blind man. Mark 23. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him uh, if he saw anything. Now he led him out of town. Why did he lead him out of town? To get him away from doubt and unbelief. To get him away from the people around who didn't, wouldn't, didn't think anything would happen. He got him out to where he could just trust in Jesus. So... I want to talk to you about how you can minister to other people. So in Mark chapter 2, 
verses 2 and 3. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him bringing one sick of the palsy which was born of four. So if you're ministering to believers, preach the word first. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Luke chapter 10 verse 9 says this, And heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. When somebody gets healed, they'll pay attention. 